Well, then let's turn in God's word to uh, Hebrews uh, chapter 4. And we're going to begin reading at uh, verse 14 of chapter 4 and read through to verse 20 of chapter 6. Hebrews 4, uh, verse 14. Our text this morning is the verses 19 and uh, 20, the first part of 20 at least, of Hebrews 6. <clears throat> Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. We have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins, who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. And by reason hereof he ought, as for the people, so also for himself, to offer for sins. And no man taketh this honour unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. As he saith also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto them that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him, called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek, of whom we have many things to say and hard to be, ut hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, and of laying on of hands, and of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. And this we will do, if God permit. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened, and have tasted of the heavenly gift, and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, and have tasted the good word of God, and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away, to renew them again unto repentance." seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh oft upon it and bringeth forth herbs meet for them by whom it is dressed receiveth blessing from God. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh unto cursing whose end is to be burned. But beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation though we thus speak. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labour of love which ye have showed toward his name, in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end, that ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater he swear by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men verily swear by the greater, 
and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife, wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the, unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay, lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth, entered into, entereth into that within the veil, whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And may the Lord bless to us his own holy and inspired word. Brethren, we're looking, uh, as I say, at uh, verses 19 and the first part of uh, verse 20 this morning. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, <clears throat> both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil, whither the forerunner is for us ended, even Jesus made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The main purpose of the writer uh, to the Hebrews in this chapter, and indeed uh, the same holds true actually for this entire epistle, was to strengthen the faith and hope of the Hebrew Christians to whom this epistle was written. Uh, as you'll be well aware, the Hebrew Christians needed encouragement. They needed to be built up in their faith. And the primary reason for that was because they had been called upon to endure, as it's described in Hebrews chapter 10, a great fight of afflictions. The pressure was on these Jewish Christians who were probably located in different parts of the Mediterranean. And the pressure was on them to abandon their profession of faith in Jesus Christ and to return to Judaism. Indeed, some of them had already done that and others were inclined to also follow that same course when they'd been converted to Christianity, uh, it was new and exciting, uh, but its attraction had waned considerably under the weight of intense persecution. And now the question that confronted these Jewish Christians was this, was it really all worthwhile? Was it worth following Jesus Christ when the cost of doing so uh, was becoming increasingly high? Their vulnerability to apostatizing from the faith was heightened by the fact that many of them were in fact spiritually immature. As, to the, writer to the, as the writer to the Hebrews actually says, they had need that one teach them again of the first principles of the oracles or the utterances of God. In other words, they had need that someone would teach them uh, the uh, basic truths again of the word of God. The truth for these uh, Jewish Christians was that they'd failed to properly grasp many of the fundamental principles of the word of God and of the Christian faith and life. The goal of the writer to the Hebrews uh, was to urge his readers then not to draw back from their profession of faith in Christ, but rather to stand firm in the faith of Christ, uh, notwithstanding the uh, chaos that seemed to be reigning uh, all around them. The fundamental basis upon which uh, the writer to the Hebrews urged these uh, Hebrew Christians to follow that course was the supremacy of Jesus Christ over the Old Testament rites and ceremonies. And so therefore throughout the epistle, the writer to the Hebrews exalts the person and work, especially the priestly work uh, of Jesus Christ over the types and shadows that belong to the Old Testament dispensation. Uh, the writer of the Hebrews, in fact, emphasises to his readers that in Jesus Christ, they had a high priest who had passed into the heavens and who was seated at the right hand of the Father and who had made full and actual atonement for their sins. And therefore, having the reality, why would they ever contemplate returning to the Old Testament rites and ceremonies, or with the external forms, the earthly high priest, 
uh, but an earthly high priest who could not actually make any genuine atonement for sin. It's, it is to that overarching theme, and particularly to the ascension of Jesus Christ to the right hand of the Father as the everlasting high priest of every believer, that the writer to the Hebrews directs our attention in our text this morning. He, he draws our attention to that subject by describing how that the believer's hope in Jesus Christ, which includes our hope in his ascension to the right hand of the Father, is the anchor of every believer's soul. The believer's hope in Jesus Christ and, he, and in his ascension to the right hand of God provides for the believer's soul the same thing that an anchor provides for a ship. It holds the believer, just as the anchor holds the ship. The uh, ascension of Jesus Christ to the right hand of God holds the believer fast and secure. And every believer, brethren, stands in need of an anchor for their souls. Life for believers today, uh, as you would only be too well aware, uh, was not dissimilar to the life of the Hebrew Christians uh, to whom this letter was written. Uh, life for believers today is uh, like a storm-driven sea. Uh, we confront many difficulties. We face many trials. We are buffeted and blown about by the events and circumstances of life. And the truth is, all of us are essentially fragile creatures. At times we tend to be fearful creatures. And uh, the rocks of trial, the rocks of sorrow, of rejection, of loneliness, of sickness and suffering uh, have a tendency uh, to uh, threaten us. And there is a very real sense in which at times we experience those storms of life that beat in upon us and they have a tendency to uh, appear as though they're going to overwhelm us. And the truth is that those storms of life have the potential to set us spiritually adrift, if not to overwhelm us completely. And that is what would happen to each one of us if we did not have a secure and certain anchor for our souls. Uh, what this word of God reveals to us, brethren, is this we desperately need. Each of us desperately need an anchor for our souls. And we, by God's grace, have such an anchor. An anchor that is actually fixed in heaven itself. And that anchor is sure and certain. And it's grounded in the ascended Saviour, Jesus Christ. I want to look at this word of God then, this morning, under this theme, the secure anchor of our souls. Uh, to follow the sermon under these headings, the idea, secondly, the basis, and then finally, uh, the comfort. Forty days after his resurrection, having confirmed the reality of his resurrection by repeated appearances to many of his disciples, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, ascended into heaven. Uh, now, we refer to that as uh, the ascension. And there, following his ascension, uh, Jesus Christ took his rightful place at the right hand of the Father. And the scriptures make repeated references uh, to that event because of the importance of that event. Uh, for example, you read in uh, Romans chapter 8 and verse 34, uh, Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, Note this, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Furthermore, the scriptures testify that uh, the session of Jesus Christ, and by the session we mean his uh, uh, attendance in the presence of God, uh, scripture testifies that the session of Jesus Christ at the right hand of the Father is a present reality. Uh, and that has been the case since his ascension into glory some 2,000 years ago. Uh, you recall that in Acts chapter 7 and verse 55, uh, you read there of Stephen at the time of his being stoned. 
And uh, it's worth bearing in mind what we read there in Acts 7.55. We read of Stephen, but he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God. And notice this, and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Listen also to what Paul writes in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Notice that Christ sitteth. He sits, present tense, he sits on the right hand of God. In other words, Jesus Christ at this very moment sits at the right hand of the Father. The ascension is a reality. Indeed, it is a present reality. And that ought to be a great comfort, in fact, to every believer. Jesus Christ, our Saviour, has entered into the sanctuary of God. While that is undoubtedly true, the question that confronts us this morning is what is the spiritual significance of the ascension to us as believers today? Yes, the ascension is a reality, but it is not enough for us to merely emphasise the event itself, but we must grasp the ongoing spiritual significance of the ascension of Jesus Christ. So the question we're going to ask through our text this morning is this, what is, what is the fundamental significance of the ascension of Jesus Christ to us as believers today? And one could put it in these terms, it's the certainty of every believer's salvation. It's the certainty of every believer's salvation. The ascension provides us with the absolute surety of the hope that we, as believers, have a place in glory with, the, uh, with Jesus Christ and with his Father. If you trust in Jesus Christ for your salvation. This is your hope. Jesus' entrance into heaven means that you, you who by the grace of God belong to and are connected to him, have the absolute certainty of also entering into the glory and eternal safety and security of heaven. Indeed, it's not to go too far to say that all who are in Christ all who trust in Jesus Christ for their salvation are even now intimately connected to heaven. Our souls are actually anchored in heaven. At his, at his ascension, Jesus Christ set an anchor in heaven for every believer, an anchor that actually is set in the very throne room of God and on account of our spiritual union with Jesus Christ on account of our what one might describe as our inextricable spiritual connection with Jesus Christ as believers we are now even as we live in the midst of the chaos of this world we are intimately connected uh, to heaven and to glory we have an assured place in glory. And at the appointed time, Jesus Christ will draw us unto himself and into the safety of the harbour of heaven. Now, employing the nautical analogy of our text, in this life, we often sail in the midst of stormy waters. And the truth is, brethren, we are sailing... Uh, both individually, uh, perhaps even as families, uh, but certainly as a denomination, we are sailing uh, in the midst of stormy waters. And there are many things uh, pulling us this way and that and which are working against our faith and which are used of Satan to discourage us and to make shipwreck of our faith. There are the waves of grief, of fear, 
of hurt, of despair that threatened to sweep over us. You might know of those things in your own uh, life. Uh, families know of that. Uh, we presently also as a church are experiencing those same things. There are the tides also, the tides of depression, of anxiety, of loss, of loneliness, of rejection that also pull us this way and that. There are the great troughs of temptation, of lust, of self-interest, of worldliness that loom large and threaten to swamp our fragile boats. The storms, the waves and the tides of life all working to prevent our entrance into the safe harbour of heavenly glory. What will hold us against the storms and the waves and the tides of life? Uh, what will protect and preserve us? What will keep us? Well, the reality, brethren, is we know assuredly we can't do it ourselves. Uh, if we seek to do it ourselves, if we think that we're going to keep ourselves steadfast in the faith of Jesus Christ, uh, we are mistaken. But the comforting truth is that as believers, uh, we do have something which is secure. We have an unmovable anchor. We have an anchor that has been set in heaven. And that anchor is the ascended Christ. Jesus Christ, this is fundamentally what this passage teaches, Jesus Christ is the anchor of the soul of every believer. In him, our hope, our salvation, our place in glory is absolutely secure. And that's what the writer to the Hebrews is referring to here in our text when he says, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. Consistent with the purpose of this epistle, the writer to the Hebrews encourages his readers and through them he encourages you and me to never let go of our hope in Jesus Christ. This was the thought that the writer to the Hebrews had been developing uh, throughout uh, chapter 6. I'm not sure whether you perhaps appreciated that as we read that uh, chapter this morning, but that's, that's the thrust of all that precedes uh, our text this morning. Uh, if you were to go back into chapter 6, you'd notice that in verse 1, the writer to the Hebrews says to his readers, let us go on unto perfection, or literally unto completion. And he then, then warns them of the danger of apostasy. He says, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted of the good word of God and the powers of the world to come if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. And then in verse 8, uh, he goes on to describe those who reject the faith of Jesus Christ and he describes them as thorns and briars whose end is to be burned. But then he goes on immediately about beloved. Uh, and he's referring there, of course, to the Hebrew Christians. He says, but beloved, we are persuaded better things of you. And then in verse 11, he says, we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. So he's now lifting their eyes up to the end of their life. And he points his readers to the promises of God and expresses his desire that the Hebrew Christians might, in verse 12 he says, through faith and patience, inherit the promises. Promises not only given by God, but promises which God had confirmed as he reveals to us by way of an oath, an oath that he swore by himself, an oath based on his own being and character. And that's why we read in verse 18, that by two immutable things, that is by two unchangeable things, and those two unchangeable things were God's promise and God's oath, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, uh, that uh, the Hebrew Christians uh, might have a strong consolation or encouragement 
who had fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope that had been set before them. And then the writer to the Hebrews continues in our text, which hope, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. And in those words, the writer to the Hebrews sets before us a powerful portrayal of the Christian hope, which is like no other hope in this world. And by hope here, he is referring uh, to the objective hope that we as believers have in the promises of God as fulfilled in Jesus Christ. A hope that is anchored in the unchanging character of God and the oath that he swore by himself, an oath that concerned his promises and the fulfilment of his promises. And brethren, that hope, that hope is the anchor of the soul of every believer. And that hope, of course, is centred in Jesus Christ, who sits at the right hand of God. Brethren, it is your hope and my hope. And it goes without saying, it's the hope of every believer uh, that Jesus Christ uh, sits even now at the right hand of the Father. And so we find here, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the writer to the Hebrews here employs a figure of speech uh, to highlight the security of the believer's hope in Jesus Christ. And that's the import of this passage. It's assuring us of the security that we as believers have in Jesus Christ. And the figure involves the anchor of a ship, a massive anchor, an unmovable anchor, an anchor of such a character and capacity that no matter how tumultuous the seas, no matter how strong the winds and the tides, the ship to which it is attached remains steadfast. It's, uh, the anchor is so great, so large, so secure that it's impossible for the vessel which is attached to it to ever be swept away. This anchor is, of course, unique uh, it's not an anchor that sits in the depths of the sea, but it's an anchor that has actually been set in heaven. Significantly, this anchor, says the writer to the Hebrews, has been set as that within the veil. Uh, interesting ph phraseology, set within the veil. What does the veil take our minds to? Well, it takes our minds naturally, of course, uh, to the uh, tabernacle and to the temple. The reference here to the veil is to the veil of the tabernacle or temple that separated the holy place from the holy of holies. And the anchor of our souls is described here as being within the veil, that is, behind the veil. And here's a question the children might like to uh, uh, contemplate. What was behind the veil of the tabernacle or temple? Different parts of the tabernacle or temple but what was behind the veil? Well, if you were to say what was behind the veil was the Holy of Holies, uh, that place in which the Ark of the Covenant was found, you'd be right. Uh, this uh, veil to which the reference is made here is the veil that separated the holy place from the Holy of Holies. And the Holy of Holies, of course, was the place where the Ark of the Covenant was to be found, and the Ark of the Covenant symbolised the presence of God in the midst of his people. And you recall that at the time of Jesus' death, what happened to that veil? Well, at the time of Jesus' death, that veil of the temple, uh, that veil that stood between the holy place and the holy of holies, was torn in two from top to bottom. What did that symbolise? It symbolised the fact that believers, on account of the death of Jesus Christ, had now contrary to what the position was before, but following the death of Jesus Christ, they had immediate access into the presence of God, into the heavenly holy of holies. So therefore, when the writer to the Hebrews here makes reference to within the veil, he's not referring to the holy of holies in the earthly tabernacle or temple, but he's referring to that which the holy of holies symbolised. In other words, the place where God actually dwells with his people. He's referring to heaven itself. 
You read, for example, in uh, Hebrews 9, verse 24, for Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands. What was the holy place made with hands? Well, that was the earthly holy place. Christ is, Jesus Christ never went into the earthly holy of holies, was not a priest uh, that was enabled to do that. Uh, but he's actually a priest, not of the Aaronic uh, priesthood, but as our text actually mentions, he's actually a priest of the order of Melchizedek. And uh, being a priest after the order of Melchizedek, he was permitted to enter into the real holy of holies. And that's what uh, Hebrews 9.24 goes on to reveal. For Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures or types of the true, but into heaven itself. That's where Jesus Christ entered into the holy of holies, in heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God uh, for us. What the writer to the Hebrews is saying is that the believer's hope, your hope, my hope, is lodged in heaven itself. What's the essence of that hope? It's the fulfilment of the promises of God, the hope of the complete blessings of salvation in Jesus Christ. It's the attainment of our eternal inheritance. It's the hope of our future glory. It's the hope of eternal life, of everlasting friendship, fellowship and communion with the living God, of being able to live in the presence of God and to uh, commune and fellowship with Jesus Christ. It's the hope that at the day of our death we will be taken into that heavenly rest. It's the hope that we have in the great resurrection where our bodies and souls will again be reunited forevermore. It's the hope that we will experience the joys and the blessings of life with God forever in body and soul. As, ble as believers, brethren, all of those things belong to our hope. And that hope and all that it entails, says the writer to the Hebrews, is set in heaven itself and is the anchor of our souls. It's that hope, that hope that rests in Jesus Christ that keeps our souls from drifting off into unbelief, into apostasy and into wickedness. It's that hope that keeps us steadfast in the faith of Jesus Christ. In other words, in the midst of the trials, the sorrows, the hardships, the upheavals, the disappointments, the pain, the hurt and the suffering that attend our lives in this world, our hope is actually the hope we have in Jesus Christ which is anchored within the veil. And it's that hope, it's as we look to those things that we are sustained and we are kept. A hope which is anchored in heaven is actually sure and steadfast. In that sense, it's not like the anchor affixed to a boat. Uh, often a boat will drag its anchor in heavy seas or in the midst of a storm, a boat's anchor will often fail and the grip of the anchor on the seafloor will not hold or even perhaps the anchor chain will snap with the result that the boat is left to the mercy of the wind and the waves with potential catastrophic results, but not so with the anchor of our souls. The anchor of our souls is sure and steadfast. It's an anchor that cannot slip. It's an anchor that cannot fail. It's an anchor that can withstand the heaviest of seas, the most violent of storms, and the strongest of tides. What is the basis for what the writer to the Hebrews asserts here concerning the anchor of our soul? It's the ascension of Jesus Christ. It's the ascension of Jesus Christ. As a result of the ascension of Jesus Christ, the anchor of our souls has been set within the veil. It's been set in the very presence of God. When Jesus Christ ascended into heaven and to the right hand of God, he became the anchor of our souls. 
That's what the writer of the Hebrews is referring to here in verse 20 uh, when he uh, writes whither, that is, uh, the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. In the ascension of Jesus Christ, the anchor of our souls was securely set in heaven. Want to know the significance of Jesus Christ uh, for us today, the ascension of Jesus Christ? For, that's it. We, we have in Jesus Christ now an anchor that is actually set in heaven. And just as a ship is anchored, our souls, our lives are also anchored and they're anchored in heaven. They're anchored at God's right hand. As believers, we have a connection to heaven and to the presence of God. And we have that in and through Jesus Christ. As you know, Christ came to this earth to live and to die for his people. And when he returned to heaven, he also did so for the sake of his people. The link as between him and his people was not broken by death. It was not broken by the resurrection. It was not broken by the ascension. His connection with us is forever sealed. It cannot be severed. And upon his return to the presence of his Father, Jesus Christ affixed the anchor of our hope, sure and steadfast, in the inner sanctum of heaven itself. The significance of the uh, ascension is highlighted here uh, when the writer to the Hebrews describes Jesus as our forerunner. Whither, that is, behind the veil, the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus. Now, it may not immediately appear, but forerunner is also a nautical term. It had to do with a familiar scene in the ancient world uh, particularly the Greek harbours were often cut off from the sea by sandbars over which larger vessels dared not pass until high tide. And therefore, in order to secure large ships uh, that had come to, come to a harbour but couldn't enter it, uh, often what would happen was that a smaller vessel, a forerunner, would take the larger vessel's anchor and uh, drop that anchor then into the harbour itself. Uh, the, uh, the larger vessel itself would hove to outside of the harbour until high tide. But having had the anchor dropped into the harbour, that ship, though still outside of the harbour, uh, was secure and simply waited for the changing of the tide when it could make its way then into the harbour. Indeed, in fact, they, the vessel often was drawn into the harbour uh, utilising the anchor chain. Uh, the entrance of, of the uh, forerunner into the harbour set the anchor inside the harbour and then the uh, larger vessel would simply pull itself ultimately into uh, the harbour. And so the entrance of the forerunner into the harbour and the setting of the anchor was the assurance that the ship itself would in time be able to safely enter into the harbour. Now think of that, the significance of that for us, uh, that's true also of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, we are told here, is our forerunner. He's actually entered into the true harbour. He's entered into the harbour of heaven. He's taken the anchor and he's set the anchor in the true harbour. He did that, of course, by his infinitely precious blood uh, and through his infinitely precious blood and the sacrifice he made, he's opened heaven to us. Jesus Christ is the assurance that we too will one day enter the harbour of heaven and into the very presence of God. United to Jesus Christ, as every, every believer is by the Spirit of Christ, our souls, this is the glory of the passage, our souls are actually already anchored in heaven. Uh, we have a, a, a connection already uh, to heaven because Jesus Christ is ascended 
and sits at the Father's right hand. And so our hope, our hope of entrance into that harbour, into that eternal, everlasting harbour, is sure and steadfast. Our place in heaven is certain. Now, brethren, you and I desperately need an anchor for our souls. Just as a ship needed an anchor in the midst of a storm or when it was near rocks, so too we need an anchor for our souls. We live in a world that is full of storms, full of waves. We're in danger at times of being swept into the troughs of despair and hopelessness. We're in danger of the waves of life crashing over us just as they did for the Hebrew Christians. That was what was happening to the Hebrew Christians. The waves of life were smashing over them. Our lives are now essentially different to theirs. Christians in every age have had this battle. It's the ongoing battle for every uh, child of God. And there is a danger. There is a danger. There's a danger to the Hebrew Christians. There's a danger to us. What's the danger? The danger is to be tempted to give up the Christian life, to abandon our hope in the promises of God, to forsake Jesus Christ. You say, that can't happen. It does happen. Look around you. You see it happening all around us. We see it even in our own our church. We need an anchor for our souls. And we have an anchor. And that anchor is Jesus Christ. And by grace, brethren, we are united to him. And brethren, we may not feel uh, sure and steadfast in our souls, uh, but without doubt, Jesus Christ is sure and steadfast. He is our sure and steadfast anchor. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today and forever. In him, our hope in the promises of God, the hope of life eternal, are sure and steadfast. The imagery employed in our text raises, if you think about it, an interesting question, an interesting point worthy of consideration. We have here the anchor which is uh, placed into heaven or the anchor of Jesus Christ uh, in heaven. And so clearly the anchor itself is secure and the chain, no doubt, that it's connected to the anchor is secure. But the question that arises is uh, what about the anchor or the connection between the chain and our souls? So the question arises, is the figure of speech in this passage this, that one end of the anchor chain is attached to the anchor by virtue of the ascension of Jesus Christ, and that connection and that anchor are firm and steadfast. But what about the anchor and the connection of the anchor to our souls? How is that to be fixed? Who's responsible for affixing the anchor chain to our souls? Uh, some would assert that uh, that responsibility falls to us. Uh, the anchor is in heaven, uh, but we need to attach ourselves to the anchor chain. And so the uh, proposition or the s suggestion is that we need to undertake in our own strength uh, the uh, connection of our souls to the anchor chain. But is that the picture? Is that the picture that we have set before us here? No doubt Christ the anchor has entered into heaven. But is it saying and suggesting to us here that we need to exercise our souls in our own strength and our own ability uh, to attach ourselves to the other end of the chain. Brethren, our souls are only as secure as both ends of the chain. If Jesus Christ ascended into heaven and everything is secure there, but we are left to take hold of the other end of the chain, uh, then the truth is we're in trouble. 
Uh, if the boat, if we are not attached to the chain by some uh, mighty grace of God, as is the anchor, we're not secure. And we'll never be secure. And if it's left to ourselves, we will never be secure. And nor will the promises of God be secure for us. In other words, if our security depends on our grasping the anchor chain, if it depends on our strength, if it depends on our commitment, if it depends on our resolve, we will inevitably be swept away by the storms and the waves and the tides of life. And you see that all around us as well. We see that all around us, men and women and boys and girls uh, who are actually being swept away by the storms and the waves of life. Brethren, that's not the picture that's being set here for us. Our security actually does not depend on ourselves. Thankfully, our security does not depend on ourselves. The anchor of our soul is not only fixed in heaven by Jesus Christ, but he is the one who also attaches the anchor chain to our souls. That's our comfort. Uh, Note what we read there. Whither the forerunner is ended for us, even Jesus, even Jesus. The one who has gone before us is Jesus. Who is Jesus? Well, literally the name Jesus means Jehovah salvation. Uh, he is the one uh, to whom the angel said to Joseph that he shall save his people from their sins. The one that's entered into uh, the uh, heavenly harbour is in fact our saviour. And as our saviour, he, by his grace, has united himself to us. What an extraordinary thing. The second person of the Trinity should actually unite himself uh, by his spirit to us. And by virtue of that, we are united to him. And... uh, as a result of that work of the Spirit in our hearts, an unbreakable bond has been established between us and our Saviour, a bond that can never be broken. That, of course, is the um, beautiful indication of that passage, that well-known passage in Romans 8, 35 through 39. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long, we are accounted as sheep to the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. And then notice this, for I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Brethren, thankfully our connection to Jesus Christ does not depend on us. Our salvation is all of grace. Our union with Jesus Christ It comes about as a result of his work in us. Jesus Christ is our anchor and he has set the anchor of himself in heaven and he has anchored us to himself by his grace. This is the significance of the ascension. By the grace of God, by virtue of the ascension of Jesus Christ to the right hand of the Father, our salvation is absolutely secure. Now, brethren, the waves and storms of life may be very boisterous, uh, and they are. They can be very, very boisterous, very, very threatening, causing us potentially to uh, be fearful, to be very anxious, But this word of God encourages us to lift up our eyes to heaven and there to behold Jesus Christ seated at his Father's right hand. There we see the anchor of our souls.
Amen. Well, let us uh, stand uh, for a brief uh, word of prayer. Uh, Lord, we need uh, the encouragement of your word. Uh, may we hear what you are actually saying to us. May the beauty and the encouragement of this word uh, sink down into our hearts. Uh, Lord, uh, life may be very difficult. Things may be coming at us from every direction. We may not understand why and the wherefores. But there is one thing certain. We have an anchor for our souls. And we are forever and will be forever uh, connected and united to Jesus Christ. And he is the one in whom all our hope and all our trust resides. And so, Lord, uh, let us uh, day by day, uh, even as this week unfolds, as all the things that come upon us uh, loom large, uh, Lord, keep our eyes on the Saviour. This we pray for our Lord's sake. Amen.